philosophical. And I want to say that those five reforms were really, when you think about it, they were the Australian contribution to the great neoliberal experiment of the last 30 years. And the fact, of course, that two of those reforms were supported by a former, and I stress the word former, Labor government appears to have escaped the attention of an Australian political figure who has recently waxed very lyrical about the failures of neoliberalism. And if I can say one other thing about those reforms, that if, as appears certain, the Rudd government proceeds to dismantle not only our industrial relations changes, but also take the country back in the area of industrial relations to conditions that obtained more than 20 years ago, then that will be the first occasion in a generation that an Australian Prime Minister has turned his back on a significant economic reform. And that will send a very bad signal to the rest of the world about this country's appetite for continuing economic reform. I think the highlights of the Coalition's years in office economically are very well known. And perhaps as each... I have watched with some fascination the contradictions that have flowed from senior government figures as they deal with current economic challenges. They have a great rhetorical dilemma and they deserve it because they cannot have it both ways. It is not plausible for the Rudd government to argue that on the one hand that Australia has entered this financial crisis in better shape than just about any other nation in the world and yet declare the government I led as guilty of the extreme neoliberalism which has in turn caused the crisis. Both positions cannot be right. And the dilemma was really best illustrated by the Deputy Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, when on the uh, snowy peaks of Davos in Switzerland, simultaneously with the release of Mr Rudd's essay, she declared her pride in the well-regulated re Australian banking system, the great strength of the Australian economy and the fact that our nation entered these difficult circumstances in better shape than others. Now, all of those statements were absolutely correct. On those three counts, Julia Gillard is absolutely right. The strength of the Australian banking system, of which the Deputy Prime Minister is so proud, is a direct result of the sensible balance between market forces and prudential regulation in Australia, which was both reaffirmed and modernised when the former government adopted the recommendations of the committee presided over by Stan Wallace and which we appointed just after we came to power in 1996. And in addition, I think it's relevant to remember that the former government resisted a lot of pressure from quite a number of people in the financial sector to abandon the so-called four pillars policy in relation to Australian banks. And that policy means that the existing four major banks are not allowed to merge. Now, ironically, and it is ironic, that the argument that was used by many in the financial sector wanting this policy change was that a change was needed to strengthen the relative position of Australian banks against banks in other parts of the world. Yet as everyone now knows, because our banks were stronger, better supervised and better managed, than others, their relative position compared to the other banks as a consequence of the financial developments in recent months has dramatically improved. There are now only 15 banks in the world that have a AAA credit rating and four of them are the major trading banks in this country. And given our size, that is an extraordinary compliment both to the regulatory framework, the balance between open market behaviour and regulation and also the quality of the management, let us be clear, of Australian banks. And given all of this, it's very clear that the four did not need to become two in order to survive in a very, very hostile world. Now all of this highlights the falsity of the claim uh, 
that our side of politics has pursued a policy of total deregulation and the unrestrained operation of market forces. In government, ours was a policy of giving preference to the operation of market forces. And that didn't mean there was no supervision and no insistence on standards. What we insisted in relation to the financial sector, for example, was that the right balance should be struck between the free operation of the market, tempered to the extent required to ensure stability, provide reasonable level of protection for depositors and other risk takers, and of course an ample degree of transparency. The world, including Australia, will not respond effectively to the economic plunge unless we properly understand its origins. And this will not be achieved if there is an artificial politicisation of our assessments, with thinly veiled attempts to divide different governments and philosophies into economic goodies and economic baddies without proper regard to what really happens. The subprime debacle originated in the United States. As I know many of you will be just as well aware, if not more than I am, Australia has never had anything like the volume of what the Americans call subprime loans or what we call low document loans. Nor to my understanding has the United Kingdom. In America, the regulations about the making of loans were far too lax and they have been for years. And it is still very astonishing to many Australians to learn that the average housing loan in the United States is a non-recourse loan. In other words, there is no personal obligation for repayment. Clearly, regulation has failed in many areas of the American financial system, and it's a failure that has been the product of both sides of politics in that country. Some of the laxity has been there for years, but some of it is fairly recent and has been deliberately driven by legislators, overwhelmingly Democrat, but including many Republican. What really happened to cause the subprime debacle in the first place was that there was an enormous push to make sure that poorer sections of the American community had access to housing loans. And the inevitable result was that far too many people received them who had absolutely no capacity to meet the interest and principal payments. Extending home ownership is a very laudable social goal. But the method employed, namely the distortion of the financial system, was economically flawed and has had some catastrophic consequences. It's yet another illustration of something that I learnt a long time ago, and that is that if governments want to assist a particular section of the community, the assistance is better delivered through direct expenditure appearing on the bottom line of the budget rather than through the distortion of the operation of the financial system, which can have immense and costly implications. There have been some failures of regulation, especially but not only in the United States. And there have been excesses on Wall Street and elsewhere, and nobody has any sympathy with some of the obscenely high levels of remuneration to which some people have helped themselves. But these failures, and it's important to understand this, and the challenges we now face do not re represent a systemic failure of capitalism or indeed of the market system. The whole construct of Mr Rudd's essay, and I have read the entire uh, 7,000 words in the monthly, is very clear. And it's very, very clear, and that is that the wicked neoliberal governments of Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan and John Howard, and can I say I'm honoured to be... Um, uh, uh, I'm honoured. Uh, even touched. <laughs> if I could say something like that about our Prime Minister. Um, that we pursued policies of total deregulation. We let the market rip. And yet, by contrast, those warmer, more cuddly and more benign social democratic administrations, uh, such as the Hawke government, the British Labor governments of my good friend, and he is a good friend of mine, Tony Blair, and Gordon Brown, and the American Democrats under Bill Clinton followed a different path and they got the balance right. And it now falls, according to Mr Rudd, to the social democrats of the world